Lord God, we come to you and, Lord, we just praise you for who you are. Lord, for your presence in our lives, for the power of your spirit. And God, for the truth of your word. And Lord, we do lift up, Lord, just um, you know, our all church events and mission trips and vacation Bible school and, and youth trips and um, summer fun and, and just all kinds of different things, Lord, that, that are coming up on the horizon. Lord, we pray, uh, Lord, just for the, these next uh, few weeks and months, Lord, as, um, as school is starting to ramp down, as we have finals and graduations and, and so many different things coming up, Lord, we just pray that you continue to lead and guide us through, through just every moment and, and um, every moment of life with you. And God, we pray as well that you would continue to, to be at work, Lord, in each of our own hearts, in the life of, of this congregation, Lord, in the life of this community, Lord, and, and, and through other churches, and, and that, God, just that, that your truth would go out, Lord, and that your light would shine in this world. And God, we thank you for, for letting us be a part of your plan to save the world. And God, not just to save uh, in the big sense, but Lord, to transform us. And Lord, this morning as we open your word, I, I pray, God, that you would open our eyes and our hearts to what we need to see. God, even as we come up against tough passages, Lord, we know that you're still there. And Lord, I pray that, that you would guide us this morning. Lord, as we continue to worship you through all we do in our lives, especially and specifically now, Lord, as we, we worship through your word. And God, I pray that, that you would continue to transform us from the inside out. God, we thank you for your presence, for your touch, Lord, that we can bring whatever we're facing to the foot of your cross. We thank you for the power and the blood of Jesus to forgive, to redeem, to turn around, to celebrate. God, guide us now as we open your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're continuing this series uh, titled The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We started it just a few weeks ago. Uh, as we were just focusing on Genesis chapter 12 through 36, and these are the stories of these three men. And again, these are names of biblical characters, right? Of Abraham, whose son was Isaac, and then one of Isaac's son was Jacob. And, and from Jacob, he has 12 sons. And, and again, that it leads into the story of Joseph, right? And it just leads eventually into the nation of Israel. And as we look at this story, again, we're, we're looking at this as we go back into the Old Testament, but, but yet we see that this is a phrase that comes up lots of different places throughout Scripture. Right? We see this phrase, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and every time it comes up, it, 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 it brings with it power. Right? A, po a power of not just the stories of these men and their families and their lives, but, but power of God that was present in their stories. The, the, the after the, we go through the narrative of their lives and, and the interaction that God has with them, um, the first place in Scripture that we see this phrase come out is, is, is in, in Exodus and the burning bush, of where God calls Moses to lead Israel out of Egypt. And again, they were in Egypt because of Joseph and because of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, right? And, and yet, God identifies himself through the burning bush as he tells Moses, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. And in that moment, again, the story turns, just like we see happen most every time that this phrase is brought up. As we fast forward into the New Testament, we see that Jesus, even Jesus himself used this phrase. And again, there was, there was a, a moment in Matthew 22 when, when he was being questioned by the religious leaders and, and specifically hear the Sadducees that were, that were pushing him about whether God could even resurrect anything. And as Jesus was talking to them, he, he used this example again of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in Matthew 22, verses 31 and 32. Where he says, long after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died, God said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. So he is the God of the living, not the dead. And we see that Jesus not only was speaking to them about, about the fact that, that God is powerful enough to raise from the dead, right, to resurrect, but again, as well as just he knew his mission as Messiah, right, was going to be to rise from the dead. And, and we know that, we, again, we, but we see the ultimate mission of the Messiah, right, as Jesus answers this question in this way. 
we see the core of the gospel, right, is that God is here to bring us to life because we are dead in our sin. That we are created for a relationship with him, and yet, again, we reap the ramifications and consequences of our sin of being separated from the Lord and, and not having that relationship with him that we were made for. That we see in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and verses 4 and 5, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. And it is only by grace that you have been saved. Again, this is the concept, again, that is attached not only to this phrase of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but to the core of the gospel. Right? That we are lost in our sin, and yet through the blood of Jesus, we can be saved by grace through faith. And this leads us to the theme that we have for this series, which is that God intervenes in our stories to bring us to life. And we see that this is a theme that, again, runs through the stories of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, and of all the biblical characters following them, and, and, and all, again, the whole line that goes from them that leads to Jesus, and, and then from Jesus, right, to, to us today, that, that this concept is one that is at the core of who God is, that he wants to intervene in our stories to bring us to life. Again, it was true for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's true for every other biblical character. It was the mission of the Messiah, Jesus, and it also can be true for us today. As we step all the way back into Genesis and say, what's the, again, the, where does this phrase come from and that power and, and what power was true in their lives and their stories, it, it is focused on Abraham and Sarah. It starts out with Abram and Cyrene, and yet we see that God changes their names. We looked at that last week, right? That, that God changes their names as a part of their transformation journey and journey of faith and walking with God. And, and their stories become a metaphor of our daily faith journey with Jesus and how we find that life that God so desperately wants for us. As we look at that again, we've just been walking, walking our way through these chapters in Genesis, and, and which is true in the first few weeks and it's absolutely true again today is that we do not have time to cover all of the text word for word that we're going to look at today. There's, uh, I've been encouraging you, I hope maybe you've been doing that. If you haven't, um, again, you, you're welcome to go back, and, but I encourage you to, to have your Bible open to Genesis, right? To be reading these passages on your own and these stories. Um, and again, if you're following the reading plan in the bulletin for the next week, like you've read through the text already and you already know what's coming. And, uh, and yet again, this morning, I just encourage you to follow along in, in your Bibles. Again, we're going to pick up right where we left off last week, uh, where we were halfway through Genesis 18. So this morning, we're going to jump back into Genesis chapter 18, and we're going to read uh, verses 16 through 33. If you are here with us in person and uh, again, don't have your own Bible with you, there are Bibles provided for you in the seats. You're welcome to grab one of those and, and follow along. Again, uh, on the, you have the outline in your bulletin, right, that you can follow along with the notes and, and see where we're headed. And uh, with that, you know, the page numbers are included there where you can find this in those Bibles. And so we're going to read this, this pretty famous interaction here between uh, Abraham and the Lord. And again, this is, we're jumping back into the middle of this, this literal physical conversation where God is manifested in human form, right? And he's having this, this back and forth conversation with Abraham. Uh, that we jumped into last week, right? We're still in the middle of that. So like you said, we're picking up here, Genesis chapter 18, starting at verse 16, which is the men got up from their meal and took and looked out towards Sodom. As they left, Abraham went with them to send them on their way. Should I hide my plan from Abraham? The Lord asked. For Abraham will certainly become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. I have singled him out so that he will direct his sons and their families to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. And then I will do for Abraham all that I have promised. So the Lord told Abraham, I have heard a great outcry from Sodom and Gomorrah because their sin is so flagrant. I am going down to see if their actions are as wicked as I have heard. If not, I want to know. The other men turned and headed toward Sodom, but the Lord remained with Abraham. Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away both the righteous and the wicked? 
Suppose you find 50 righteous people living there in the city. Will you still sweep it away and not spare it for their sakes? Surely you wouldn't do such a thing, destroying the righteous along with the wicked. Why would you why you would be treating the righteous and the wicked exactly the same. Surely you wouldn't do that. Should not the judge of all the earth do what is right? And the Lord replied, if I find 50 righteous people in Sodom, I will spare the entire city for their sake. And then Abraham spoke again, since I have begun, let me speak further to my Lord, even though I am but dust and ashes. Suppose there are only 45 righteous people rather than 50. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And the Lord said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 righteous people there. Then Abraham pressed his request further. Suppose there are only 40. And the Lord replied, I will not destroy it for the sake of 40. Please don't be angry, my Lord, Abraham pleaded. Let me speak. Suppose only 30 righteous people are found. And the Lord replied, I will not destroy it if I find 30. And then Abraham said, since I have dared to speak to the Lord, let me continue. Suppose there are only 20. And the Lord replied, then I will not destroy it for the sake of the 20. Finally, Abraham said, Lord, please don't be angry with me if I speak one more time. Suppose only 10 are found there. And the Lord replied, then I will not destroy it for the sake of the 10. And when the Lord had finished his conversation with Abraham, he went on his way and Abraham returned to his tent. Does this feel like a precarious conversation to anybody else? (laughs) Right? I mean, we see as Abraham comes to, to the Lord, I mean, literally, physically, this physical conversation he's having to the Lord sitting in front of him, and, and, and again, get, it's, this starts out, right, with the Lord literally having this conversation with these other two angels, right, that, that are, uh, these other men that are with the Lord, and, and, and purposely saying it, right, so that Abraham overhears it. Right? It's one of those moments, right, we've all kind of been in those situations, right, when, when you're keeping a secret, Right? And but yet you say it loud, right? So everybody can hear it. The worst kept secret ever. Right? And, and he's got, the Lord asks this kind of proverbial question. He's like, should we hide this from Abraham, what we're really here to do? Right? And obviously, I mean, the, the Lord answers his own question because the, the guys go to Sodom and, and God tells Abraham, like, we're here, I mean, for a few reasons, right? One of them was to bring this news about Sarah and, and change their names and Isaac and all those things we looked at last week, and he's like, but we're also here in judgment. Right? We're here doing our homework, right? Investigating of, of like what we've heard about Sodom and Gomorrah, we're gonna go see, is it really true? Right? Because if it is really true, well, justice needs to be served, right? And, and I think we have see this, this again, this conversation that, that, that goes back and forth between Abraham and that it starts though with this premise, right? That God tells him in, in verses 20 and 21. The Lord told Abraham, I've heard a great outcry of Solomon Gomorrah because their sin is so flagrant and I'm going down there to see if their actions are as wicked as I've heard. If not, I want to know. And I think that's really where we start this morning as we jump into these, these quite bluntly, very, very hard passages of scripture that are we're about to dive into. And yet, to, to see that, that the heart of God is still like, I want to know, like, I want to, like, and we all know it's God, right? Like, he already knows, right? But yet, we see the heart of God is like, but I want to know, like, you. I want to know them. I want, like, the heart of God is relational, right? He wants to know. And, and again, as we go through this entire conversation, right, this, this back and forth negotiation between Abraham and the Lord uh, about this justice, right, that the, that the Lord and these angels are here to administer, we see, again, this back and forth through this whole interesting conversation of where there is some wrestling going on. There is some reverence, right? I mean, we can feel that as Abraham's kind of like, Lord, please, you know, like, can I please speak again? And, you know, God's like, yeah, what, you know, spit it out, Abraham, right? Like, and, and, and we see this, again, going back and forth, but yet what, what's happening here, I think, as we see is that, that God is taking Abraham down a journey in this conversation, right? God is molding Abraham's heart and his mind, 
right? And he's bringing him in on just the, the, this realization and acceptance of what justice really calls for. Of even what justice really is. And I think, again, justice is one of those buzzwords, especially today in our, in our current culture, right, that has been hijacked in a lot of different ways. And as we think about that and realize that, 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 that God is taking Abraham down this, this road, down this journey, this, this conversational learning, right, of, uh, of, of realizing first off that justice can be a very complicated thing. Right, that again, we bring in different perspectives, specific details, varying motivations and and the different people involved on both sides of an issue and all these kinds of things it's it's it, it could be very complicated it might not be quite as cut and dry as we first feel it should be and yet as we see this interaction right between god and abraham and this journey that is taking him down to start to realize we we soon see that God has some bigger purposes in this conversation. And as, as we go through this, the first thing that we kind of see happening here is that this conversation was, was about Abraham's development as a leader. Okay, that, that God is, is trying to, again, train Abraham in the ways of the Lord and the way that God thinks and as interaction and the heart of who he is and all these things. And, and we see, again, in, through verses 17 through 19, that, that God is here specifically to take Abraham down a road of learning. Okay, especially with the fact that the, the, there's a pending birth, right, of Isaac, of, of this prophesied son and God is training Abraham not just on what he needs to do as a leader of a nation but why right that there are complicated situations and and again he's he's training Abraham through this and yet in the midst of these verses we see that that God gives Abraham a very specific task right that he is to accomplish as a leader Okay, and we see in verse 19, God tells him, I have singled him, the Abraham, out so that he will direct his sons and their families to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. And then I will do for Abraham all that I promised. Again, it goes back to even what we see before of, of this idea that a covenant is between two people, right? And both sides of a covenant have responsibilities. And they need to hold it there into the deal. And again, God's reiterating Abraham's part of this covenant. And that is, right, to, to make sure that his sons and their families, right, and the eventual nation that comes from them will just keep the way of the Lord. Which again, naturally implies that there's lots of other ways that we could go, right? And again, primarily, how do we do that, right? Is we do that by, by our actions they're doing the right things and the just things, right? Just as God is here, says we, that I'm here with these angels to administer justice, right? Which, again, is a very complex weave. And, and as we see, you know, not just, just the pending birth of Isaac and the leadership that Abraham needs to take, but, but again, in the midst of this conversation is... is comes out of what's about to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? And what is about to happen to them, we realize as we jump into the story that, that so, where Sodom and Gomorrah are and the sins that are, and the wickedness and everything that's made its, its way to the ear of the Lord, and they come to, to give justice in, and, and in the midst of all of this, that it ultimately is the result of the people in Sodom and Gomorrah not doing what God is telling Abraham to do which is to remain in the way of the Lord. <laughs> right, that they've drifted from that. And that, that, again, the weight of coming on to Abraham of what is the result if you don't do this task, <laughs> if you don't take it seriously. 
And again, he's teaching Abraham this, this core leadership lesson that as a leader, you must sometimes make the right, to see, the right decision. You know the decision is right, even if it harms people you care about. If you know it's right, you still have to do it. And again, I will tell you as a pastor, I said that's the hardest part of being a pastor, right, is making leadership decisions that I know are right that I know God is directing me to do that will also make some of you upset. Right? And there's this, this, this core leadership lesson, right, that, that, the, that the Lord is teaching Abraham. But not only that, but it was also about Abraham practically applying what he knew about God's character. Right? He, again, we, we see and learn about God's character, right, that God is just and God is loving, and it's all at the same time. Okay, in fact, that's, that's, that's what, exactly what Abraham brings to the Lord, right? He's, he's, that's how he starts out this negotiation. He's like, Lord, I mean, I mean you're, you're, you're God, right? Like, like, you wouldn't destroy the righteous with the wicked, right? Like, like, that's just against who you are. And notice God doesn't disagree that that's who he is. He is just and he's loving all at the same time. And and Abraham himself is wrestling with this. Like, how can both be true? And God is, is again, taking him down this road, this conversation, this this journey to show him that they can be both true. The whole story shows that God is just and gracious all at the same time. Again, and this is a tension that is hard to swallow and yet is still true. The truth is and always will be that the wages of sin is death. Right? That sin steals, kills, and destroys. That's what sin does every time. No exceptions. All sin leads to death, period. No exceptions or exclusions. That price must be paid. Again, this leads to the, again, a very common question that's still very prevalent in our world today, right, of of, of this tension of, of a loving God that is also just. And that common question is, how can a loving God send people to hell? I can a loving God do that? I mean, that's what justice calls for. The wages of sin is death. Right? And that spiritual death is complete separation from the Lord. That's what hell is. Right? And, and as we say, again, how, the reality is, right, that a loving God can also be just. They both can be true. Because the truth is that God doesn't send people to hell. Our loving God provided a way back to him by grace through faith. Our loving God gave us a choice to accept this gift of his love that comes through the blood of Christ. Our loving God provided us a way out. A price he paid for with his life. And yet God is also just. Which means that if we reject that way out, that we will suffer the consequences of our sin. Then the loving God gave us a way out. The loving God has told us what justice requires. Right? That, the, that, that sin leads to death every time, and that price must be paid. He is just, but he's also loving because he sent us Jesus. So the hard reality is the wages of sin is death that that price must be paid, right? And if we suffer under the hand of the justice of the Lord, it's our own choosing. And we see in the midst of this conversation, right, that at the end of the story in Genesis 19, we understand that this conversation, again, was, was beneficial and profitable Right, in many different layers. And we see at the, at the conclusion right, of Solomon and Gomorrah and everything that's about to happen in Genesis chapter 19, 
right? We, we learn that, that God listened to Abraham's request and he kept Lot safe, removing him from the disaster that engulfed the cities on the plain. Okay, and now, again, these, these cities, right, Sodom and Gomorrah, and, and, and again, they get destroyed, right? And again, we're about to jump into Genesis 19, which, which shows us why. And, and yet, in the midst of that, we have to pause and realize that God was influenced by Abraham, right? That our prayers do matter. These conversations with the Lord, our intercession, right, for, for other people and even for ourselves and, and through that that, 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 that our prayers do matter. God was influenced by Abraham, right? I 100% believe that if 10 righteous people were found, that God would not have destroyed the city. Again, I think we have to realize that, that something God already knows and it's something else that he was teaching Abraham through this conversation, right? That, and something that Abraham learned is that the presence of righteousness, even if it's small, still has the potential to positively influence the wicked towards God. Right? That even if there was a little bit of righteousness, even just 10 people in an entire city, God says, no, I will not destroy it because there's still hope. Right? And yet we also have to sit back and wonder, why did Abraham stop at 10? Right? Why didn't he go further? I mean, why didn't he even go bound? Because like, you have to think in your mind, right? That Abraham's thinking like, well, Lot's there. Right? So there, there should be at least a few righteous, right? So like, why didn't Abraham continue the negotiation? <laughs> right? Because I think, again, part of this journey that God took him on was, was that, that Abraham realized, right, that there is a point that if righteousness becomes too small, right, that evil will prevail over righteousness if, it, if that presence is too small. But this conversation ends with God and Abraham both comfortable with where the conversation landed, and it shows that they both moved on. Right? God moved on, you know, towards Sodom. Adam, uh, Abraham went back to his tent, and, and they were both content in this moment with where they had landed. Right? And we see, again, these, these leadership lessons, these things of, of why would God even do have this conversation? And, and yet we see that they're, the, the layers are deep. And yet as we move to this, then we move into Genesis chapter 19. Hey, now, I, again, we don't have time to read the whole text and to go through that. I get spoiler alert, if you haven't read it yourself, Sodom and Gomorrah get destroyed. Yeah, as we think about this, though, again, we, we jump into, as we go into Genesis 19, the, the narrative switches. It switches from Abraham, and it moves to these two angels, and they're, them going into the city to, to, make, to investigate what God said they were there to investigate, right? To know for sure. They, and as they enter into the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, okay, and, and through this, as the story plays out through Genesis 19, um, there are three main phases that happen in this story. Again, the first phase is these two angels visiting Sodom, and, and as they arrive, they, they have this immediate interaction with Lot, okay, where he's sitting at the city gate in a prominent position. We'll kind of come back to that in a moment. Okay, and, and then Lot takes them into their their into his home, okay, and, and things go south very fast in Sodom. Okay, and in fact, it, it, the text says the entire city ends up outside Lot's house with very vile intentions. Okay, and, and with that said, the, the, the next phase, right, as, as again, that we come along in the story and we learn what God already knew, but that God was there to, to confirm, is that there is none righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, and, and so then the next phase of the story is that is the removal of Lot and his family and the destruction of these towns on the plain that are carried out. And then the last kind of phase in this story in Genesis 19 is the aftermath of the destruction that continues with Lot and his daughters. Let me say that again. There's some aftermath, and all of the destruction continues with Lot and his daughters. It's chapters like Genesis 19 that make us pause as students of the Bible. 
Because one is, again, it's reminded something that I, I told all the youth kids growing up in all of my years of teaching the Bible, that the Bible's rated R. It is. Because it tells us the truth. I mean, it tells us what really happened, right? It tells us that the Bible's rated R, right? We would not let our kids go to this movie. Okay, the other thing, the hard reality of that, is that this is everything that happens here and, and going through that, right, is that this reading this text, and again, I literally sat in my office this week preparing this message, and to say this is true, that reading this chapter of scripture makes you sick to your stomach. And if you read it this week, it probably had the same thing for you. And again, I just, just pausing to say, as we think about Solomon more and uh, the wickedness that was there, okay, is it that um, this, the sin in Solomon Gomorrah in these cities was not just sexual sin? It, it says that they were, they were wicked, completely wicked, all the way through. Every phase of their life was evil. Was there sexual sin present there? Absolutely. Hey, but I think we do a huge disservice, and I think even within our, our American Christian community, is that we hear Sodom and Gomorrah and we naturally connect it to the sin of homosexuality. In fact, Genesis 19 is one of those six clobber passages that we use against homosexuality. And to say that, like, was it present in Sodom and Gomorrah? Yes, it was. But it was way bigger than that one issue. And, and again, I think part of the temptation for us to just be like, no, Sodom and Gomorrah was about homosexuality. I think part of the temptation of that is just so that we just don't have to deal with it in our own hearts. And we can't go there, church. As true followers of Jesus and students of the Bible, we, just can't, we can't just write it off in that way. They, they, these cities again, are mentioned several different places throughout Scripture, and they are always an example of heinous sins and severe disaster. They are not just specifically calling out homosexuality. It is calling out evil and wickedness and, and represents everything that will happen to every human if we let ourselves drift further and further away from God and let sin run rampant in our lives. And as we look at the overall, you know, viewpoint of this story and of Genesis 19 that makes us sick to our stomach every time you read it, okay, we have to realize that Lot found himself on a journey away from God. And it's one that results in a terrible downward spiral deep into sin and destruction. You know, again, it's, it's, just, it's interesting that, that this previous conversation that we just looked at, right, that Abraham, uh, I kind of, I, we can read into his motivations, a part of that is that he wanted to save Lot, right? Like that, that was just part of the reason that this even comes up. And, and again, because in, in Abraham's mind, Lot was righteous, right? He's like, well, I know I've got at least a couple aces in the hole in this, in this negotiation, right? Like Lot's there. And yet, however, in this text, in Genesis 19, it never confirms that Lot was righteous. Hey, now, he was saved because Abraham interceded for him, not because he was among the righteous. That's what the text tells us. Hey, and the reality is that Lot, as he, and he, he chose this place, right? When him and Abraham decided to split ways and they went into that, right? Lot chose to go here because of, of the beauty of it, the promise of it, the area. Like, this is where he went. And yet, yet we see there's, there's clues throughout Genesis 19 that we see how much Lot was affected and sucked into the culture around him once he arrived there and lived there. The influence of the culture of Solomon Moore on Lot was not good. They, in fact, even the fact that, that Lot was sitting at the city gate when the angels arrived shows the central and prominent position that Lot had found in that culture. And, and, and yet, as those angels show up and all of the, the, the terrible stuff that happens you know, in the midst of Genesis 19, okay, and, and through all of that, um, we see that literally these angels and, you know, 
Ultimately, God himself is, is begging Lot to leave. He's telling you, he's like, the city is being destroyed, and you need to get out now so that you don't get sucked in any further than you already have and end up being destroyed yourself. And yet, in Genesis 19, verse 16, it says, Lot still hesitated. To the point, right, where the angel seized his hands and the, of, his, of him, his wife, his two daughters, and they rushed them out of safety to the city. Because of why? Because the Lord was merciful. Not because, it doesn't say because Lot was righteous. It was because the Lord was merciful. And I think, again, as we realize this and see this, right, that Lot did not want to leave. Right? He, he didn't want to leave. But yet God still shows him grace. And in fact, if you look at Lot's actions throughout the chapter, you see how he was always acting on his own power and protecting his own self-interest. His actions had nothing to do with God or his faith. Even to the point, it escalates to the point that he willingly offers up his two daughters to be violently and sexually abused by the crowd. And thankfully, these two angels step in and defuse the situation before that happens. But it was in spite of Lot's actions, not because of them. And I think we see kind of the first big lesson we take out of Genesis 19 is that it is easy to not take God's ways and warnings seriously if our judgment gets clouded by sin. Whew, can we all take a deep breath? It's easy to not take God's ways and warnings seriously if our judgment gets clouded by sin. And in fact, we see this happen throughout the chapter one. Again, even when Lot realizes the, the gravity of this is he goes to his daughter's fiancés, which again, there's a whole other thing. His daughter has fiancés. Let's just think about that for a moment. And what? Whole other layer to what Lot did. Right? But they goes to them and he says, hey guys, we have to get out of here because God's about to, and they, they literally laugh at him. They're like, no, you're just joking. Right, and then again, Lot's hesitation to leave, and we see that. And then also, we, again, pretty famously, right, in, in, in verse 26 of 19, where once they're out of there and they were directed, don't look back. Don't even don't let your heart, your mind, even your physical body even look back. Like you have to run from the sin and the evil and all that's there. And yet Lot, Lot's wife looks back, and she's turned into salt. Right? And we see all of these things and realize how, how easily it is to just to take God's warnings and God's ways, and, 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 and with the coming judgment that we know is coming, right? And we just kind of throw it to the side. Right? And, and then, again, the story, as it continues through this, right, comes to just an incredible tragic ending in verses 30 through 38. Right? Where, I mean, Lot and his daughters are, end up in this cave, in the mountains. And there's two just incredible ironies that, cut, that happen here. One, Lot, Lot ends up in the mountains where he was directed to go in the first place, but he, he refused. Earlier in the story, Lot chooses this area again as a paradise, and yet he ends up in a barren cave. And he stepped into what he thought was the best part of the land, and yet was influenced by culture around him and ended up in a terrible place that even himself didn't want to leave. Right? And he founds himself trapped in his own sin. Right, this, and secondly, right, is the irony of the fact that Lot, earlier in the story, offers up his daughters for sexual abuse in Sodom, and he ends up being the one that engages in these acts. He becomes the passive sexual object that he had determined his daughters should become. A story of desperation, deception, drunkenness, and incest. A terrible pool of sin. Which brings us to the real reason why this chapter makes your stomach turn. Right? Because it 
it should make our stomach turn because it is a cautionary tale for all of us. We see the similar turn of events happening around us all of the time and all the chaos and the pain that is caused by the terrible pool of sin and evil in our world. And it is a gut punch to realize that it isn't just out there, but it can be this close to home. It was even inside Abraham's family. Right? And, and, and the gut punch is realizing that this, this safe is it's even inside of our churches. <laughs> it might even be present in me. And it's in these moments, right, when we realize the, how true the words of Paul are in Romans chapter 7. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from the life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God that the answer is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Right, can we all take a proverbial deep breath at that? As we realize this, right, the, as we move forward in the narrative, we see that this is the last place we hear of Lot in Genesis. His story ends there, unfortunately. Now, there are lots of glimpses of redemption. In fact, we, we could hope and, and believe that he never lost his faith, right, that he was able to turn back to the Lord later in life, you know, as he, once he's removed from, from that culture and from that situation. In fact, even in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, he is called righteous. Okay, but I think we could all agree that he certainly was not in that place in Genesis 19. Okay, the other sign that, again, we hope that, that Lot was able to change the direction of his journey, right, that he could receive, you know, even the prophetic blood of Jesus, and it is that powerful, and it can do that for your journey the same way it did for Lot. Especially if you realize that realization that your journey is taking you further away from God. Also, we see, again, from the text, the descendants of these two kids that come out of this incestuous relationships um, are, are one of the, is the Moabites, the Mo, one of the most famous Moabite in scripture is Ruth. Right? And, and we see, again, a, a glimpse of that. She is included in the line of David and eventually of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. So the, again, the side of hope of this, and Lot, again, was, was caught up in a journey that was leading away from God, where Abraham found himself in a journey that was leading him toward God. One that, that results in a fulfilled promise of an heir with Sarah. Again, his journey was definitely not a smooth one. Um, just like Lot's, there was definitely a struggle with sin. And you see in Genesis chapter 20, verses 1 through 18, um, that he ends up in, in moving with Sarah, right, and, and moves into an area, and he has his dealings with this man called um, Abil, Abimelech. Okay, and, and again, he does the same thing there that he did earlier in the story we saw where he, he, he lies about Sarah being his wife. Okay, now, um, again, it's just... A, we, dive into that, encourage you to read it yourself, to see the tone of it is very different than the first time we see him do it. But yet, again, we also see that Sarah continues to, to be molded by God. She struggles with her own sin, and even with her interaction between her and Hagar and Ishmael, and all this continues. But again, ultimately, we learn that Abraham and Sarah still struggled with sin, but they never lose their faith. Okay, even in the midst of all of this, we see again the birth of Isaac happens in Genesis chapter 21, uh, which in verses 1 through 21, again, it, it, which is 25 years after the initial promise that God gave him in Genesis 12, 4. Again, this was 25 years of molding and transformation with God before they were ever given the child. And we see in verses 8 through 21 that their molding definitely was not over, where Sarah still has bitterness towards Hagar and Ishmael, and God ends up dividing this household right down the middle right, in order to make it all uh, um, palatable. Yeah, you see in Romans chapter 4, verses 18 through 20, right, it says, Even though there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, That's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though... At about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead. 
and so was Sarah's womb. But Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this he brought glory to God. Hey, Genesis 21 through uh, 22 through 34, he has further dealings with, uh, with uh, Abimelech, okay, and Abraham and, and him, they come to find peace and common ground through reverent fear of El Olam, which is the eternal God. And again, we see um, the hope and peace that comes through a God that can even work through our sin. Okay, we see again the, the, the posture of, of, of Abimelech, I can't even say his name this morning, Okay, where he says, God is obviously with you, helping you in everything you do, as he's saying this to Abraham. Okay, we see, again, in Abraham's response to all this, even when he's called out in his own sin, okay, that Abraham planted a tamarisk tree at Beersheba, and there he worshiped the Lord, the eternal God, right? And this is where we see El Olam, the God Abraham lived as a foreigner in Philistine country for a long time. As we look at all of these chapters, they just say is that these chapters are a cautionary tale for all of us. Abraham and Lot started from the same place, but their journeys ended up dramatically different places. However, both of them and their struggle with sin, they left a wake of carnage. Okay, and again, that's, we see the real gut punch of all of this, right, of both of their stories. Right, is, is the fact that my faith journey affects way more than just me. Hey, my faith journey affects way more, and so does yours. It affects way more than just you. My sin affects others, and my righteousness affects others. Right? And the same is true for you. Which is ultimately why we all end up at kind of the same place where Lot and Abraham both had to end up. Right? And that is at the feet of Jesus. In a prayer of confessions or repentance or whatever it might be. Okay, which brings us, though, to, to Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, which is our final thought for today. And again, as we you know, get through the end of these, these incredibly tough passages, right, we can rest in the hope that comes in Romans chapter 8. It says, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs> And because you belong to him, the power of this life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. And as we see that, that truth, yet I encourage you, whether you realize your journey is taking you closer to the cross of Christ today or you're drifting further away, is that I hope that you will be freed from the power of sin and death in your life and in those around you that it's affected right, by the power of the cross. Again, I hope that you can commit to the, to the Lord this morning, whether that's for the first time and accepting him as your Savior and, and joining the journey of faith and moving for the first time towards Jesus in that, in that journey, right? Or whether it's just realizing that, you know what, I haven't taken my faith seriously enough and that I, I've been drifting away from the Lord, of recommitting to that. Maybe it's just celebrating the fact that God is transforming me and I am focused on Jesus. Hey, but I'm gonna close this in a word of prayer and then, but as we dismiss, again, if you want to pray yourself, you can come up to the altars and pray. If you want to be prayed for or prayed over, you can help receiving Christ. You can go to the back of the room at that cross. And again, there's a pastor there waiting to talk with you and pray with you. But let's pray together as we conclude our service this morning. Lord God, we thank you, God, for the truth of your word. God, we thank you that you tell us the truth, even when it's hard. And God, we thank you that you are just and you are loving. And God, we thank you for Jesus, Lord, that he paid the price for our sin. And God, that we can be set free. Lord, that we can break out of the cycle of sin and death and of drifting further away from you, God, that we can pray you into our lives. God, we can be transformed by your spirit, God, and move closer to you. Lord, that you can bring us back to life. And God, I pray that for everyone here this morning. God, that we could submit to your will. That we could have our faith in Jesus. God, we can have that restored relationship with you. God, regardless of how deep our sin has taken us. Lord, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for the hope 
that it brings to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And I pray, God, that as we go this week, that we would shine your light in this world. God, this sometimes feels like we're living in Sodom and Gomorrah, but Lord, we know that you are there to save us and to save them. Lord, help us this week to live out our faith and to share it with those that so desperately need you. We love you. We praise you. Guide us as we go. In Jesus' name we pray.